We are a province which has been knitted together from former homelands and South Africa, and there are different peoples who have come in time to reside in the Northwest. And therefore, you've got different cultures and even different forms of ideologies playing. But what worries us most is the inability by some amongst us in the Northwest to recognize that we are just human beings, black and white. That we need to knit together to be a society, a Northwest, a society, and a nation in South Africa. So we thought that we should indeed take the opportunity as the Northwest to say with all these problems, domestic violence, unhappiness around the farming areas, the townships, the lack of coherent service delivery, lack of respect, increasing crime levels, that we need to be doing something about it. And therefore we are availing ourselves today to begin to cobble together a strategy which will enable us to coerce, to come together, to unite, to sing from the same hymn book. We cannot, um, Honorable Premier, try to convince the people that we can change the attitude of the people because once we talk about a moral regeneration, we are talking about changing the attitude of the people changing the approach. But as long as people are, some people are sleeping with hunger, really, it is a waste of time. For us to be able to achieve the social cohesion, we need to tap onto uh, the economic issues. I mean, the Minister of Finance in 2010 in his budget speech reflected that we've got a challenge whereby 50% of the population shares 8% of the state revenue which that on its own it needs to be attended to. Lastly, the, the issue of language in our universities must be prioritized. Our African languages are undermined, and you know the role that is played by the language in the cultural enhancements, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. We represent what we call the GBLTI community. For nine out of 10 South Africans and people across the world, your biological sex, your gender identity, and your sexual orientation fits seamlessly with your values, with the values of your church, with the values of your society. But there are differences. There are those whose biological sex is not clear. We are raised to believe there's male and female, but in fact, medically, one in 2,000 births are gender indistinct. So there are many among us who are not clearly male or female. They have what we call intersex issues. In addition to that, there is your sexual orientation. Those are the people that you are physically attracted to for intimacy and for love. So when you are in a minority where your biological sex is not clear, where you struggle with gender identities, and where you have sexual attraction to somebody of the same sex, which is then stigmatized in our society and has in fact in the past been criminalized by the importation of colonial rules against same-sex behavior, you suffer immense individual pain growing up, you suffer rejection from your families, you suffer bullying at school, particularly if you present in a gender non-conforming way, if you don't dress or move or behave in those traditional gender roles. We, we also hail, Honorable Deputy President, from a very painful past where when a young woman would meet someone with albinism condition, particularly albinism conditions are those that looks like me. The first thing that this, this, the first contact that they would have, this young woman would pull her clothes, look at her boobs, spat on her boobs to try and stop the cares of having a child with albinism. It was piercing more than a sharp razor when I saw a young woman because I knew in future I needed a wife. And when that kind of rejection is displayed and no elder, 
would be reprimanding and would be saying to this child, it's not proper. That is a human being. A human first, motopele disability later. And you, we would have to live through that kind of rejection for the rest of your life. Moral cohesion is a function of better life for all. Because if we don't address the material conditions of our people and we leave them in circumstances that, uh, in the words of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., in his letter, he wrote a letter to a governor from Birmingham prison, which in part reads as follows. It's because the governor was saying to them, Martin Luther King and them who were in jail, be patient, wait. And so Martin Luther King says, uh, when you are forever fighting against the degenerating sense of nobodiness, nobodiness. And so many of our people are forever fighting against the degenerating sense of nobodiness. They, they are regarded as nobodies. And so they can't wait. They can't be patient. And we who are in comfortable positions and dwellings have no right to say to them, wait, be patient. We have no such right. They have all the right to demand that their issues be addressed forthwith, without any delay.